Hello, welcome to JNO Live. I'm Seth Truder, digital media editor at Gemini Robin. Of course, if you're following live, send your questions or comments on the Twitter at Gemini Robin or on Facebook Live or YouTube in the comment section. Today, we are talking about COVID-19 outcomes among persons living with or without diagnosed HIV infection in New York State. We have senior author Dr. Eli Westmark with us. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. We're really glad you could join this interesting topic. If you could just start by telling us who you are, what you do, and why this study. Sure. So um, I'm an associate professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the Albany School of Public Health. Um, and this work was done in really close collaboration in many ways, also really led by the New York State Department of Health. Um, and together, we've been working on a variety of studies of relevance to COVID-19 um, throughout the, the pandemic. And this is sort of a latest uh, paper in, in, in a lot of it's sort of a, a bigger portfolio of work that we've all been working on together. Um, I historically am an HIV researcher, and though I've been involved in the pandemic in many ways, this is sort of a, uh, to me, sort of a, a coming home of a lot of topics that I'm, I'm strongly interested in. Right. So if you could talk about what do you do here for the study? Uh, sorry, what did I do here for the study? Yeah. Yeah, you- yeah sure. So, um, so this really uh, uh, was a, uh, like I said, a collaboration of sort of multiple units of the Department of Health and also the School of Public Health to merge and uh, to link multiple data sets, HIV surveillance, uh, uh, COVID-19 diagnoses coming in through laboratory surveillance, as well as a a statewide hospitalization database to understand the increased risk of COVID-19 diagnoses, hospitalizations, and deaths among persons with HIV uh, diagnoses compared to those without HIV diagnoses in New York State. Great. And this is really interesting. I think most of the money is in the figure here, where if you look at the um, the rates of uh, HIV diagnosis, hospitalization, and other important outcomes, how they compare between people living with HIV and people without. Um, and it's really just uh, interesting across the board. So you want to talk about that? Sure, sure. So um, I'll have, I, I can't see the figure, but I'll pull it up oh, sure. uh, um, here. Um yeah, I think this does really summarize um, t- summarizes the story really well. So, I would I would almost point to the third row, um, the 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 row that says in hospital death with COVID nineteen per population, and I'll point fo- uh, point you to the two point five five. To me, that's really the take home, the biggest high level story, right? When we look at just per population per capita, people living with an HIV diagnosis in New York State during this period from March to June seventh of twenty twenty died from COVID-19 at two and a half fold the rate of persons without an HIV diagnosis. Now, that's just like the most raw uh, view of the information. Um, when we start adjusting for confounders, those factors that might be associated with both an HIV diagnosis and a COVID-19 diagnosis, um, and I'll, I'll say specifically uh, older age, right? We know people with li- living with the diagnosis of HIV tend to be older, male sex, living in the New York City area where both infections are concentrated in New York, that comes down to 1.23, the, the, the results to the right. So still a 23% elevated risk of, of mortality from uh, COVID-19 in the hospital after those adjustments. But I think that first high level, that's sort of the, the, the causal why piece, the highest level piece is the fact is we lost people living with HIV in New York at two and a half fold rate um, uh, as those without. Right. And that's that's really fascinating. Uh, we actually have a question from a, uh, from a viewer. What were the social determinants of COVID-19 severity you referred to in the paper? The social, de- the social determinants referred to in the yeah. paper. So we didn't uh, directly uh, include uh, social determinants in this analysis. This is truly um, uh, a linkage of, of, of many da- of administrative databases where we couldn't really get a lot of that nuance that I would love to get in follow-up studies. Um, tr- you know, it, it, depending which aspects of the analysis, we were able to com- uh, uh, control for region, uh, race, race, ethnicity, when we were looking among the HIV uh, diagnosed population only. Um, but there's really just so much more we need to get into to understand and pick apart uh, the why the why here. Yeah. And what what? Sorry, I didn't mean to put it on the spot for the question there. But um, one of the things I found really, um, really fascinating here is for most of what we've seen about the disparities in COVID um, outcomes, it's not, you know, there's there's lots of discussion about uh, disparities, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic disparities. Right. Um, 
And most of that seems to be in who gets COVID, um, you know, people from black communities, uh, other people of color, Hispanic, et cetera, who are, uh, right. you know, more likely to be lower income, uh, more likely to be essential workers who can't work from home. Like, you know, I can my nice little home office here um, and things like that. Uh, but a lot of the disparities in outcomes seem to be quashed once they hit the hospital door and the hospital based outcomes seem to be pretty similar across the board. This seems to be the opposite story here, that the rates of infections okay. seem to be about the same once you adjust for confounding. Um, but then the outcomes in the hospitals seem to be worse. That's right. It's absolutely right. And we we did an earlier study um you know, in the spring that really got, it was, we documented exactly that in New York, that when we looked at race ethnicity, for example, that really a lot of the disparities in outcomes started at the community level at levels of infection. So you're absolutely right. And you might expect because, you know, HIV infection is so strongly associated with race and ethnicity that you might see uh, a similar uh, phenomenon here. And I might say that, you know, in the, we maybe see a little bit of a signal of that in the 1.43 at the top there, that that diagnosis sort of without the adjustments in this case with sex, age, and region, um, and region may be a little bit guess until race, you know, sort of in, in New York, uh, there's a strong association between where you live and your race ethnicity that maybe that's some of it baked in there, but after that adjustment, it goes away. And um, so you're absolutely right. And I think, um, and we were a little surprised too, because we thought we'd still see a persistent uh, difference in race ethnicity, you know, in, in that, in that there's sort of, yeah, in that what you decide there about diagnosis. Um, but here, the real piece that stood out is that where the disparities emerged was really at the level of hospitalization, um, and not even about uh, death in the hospital once once you're there. It really was about um, the likelihood of requiring hospitalization that seemed to to drive the ultimate uh, increased risk for mortality. Yeah, and that, if I'm reading this right, the, the corrected uh, stat there is 1.38 or 1.4, so about a 40% increase in risk of a or. I don't know. We can get into all sorts of statistical discussions of that, but but an increase in risk of requiring hospitalization, right? That's right. That's so. really the I think the most important number in all of this, in, in terms of the mechanisms and the why, um, is that that thirty eight percent increased risk of hospitalization. And this, in fact, you know, when we compare this study to some of the earlier studies um, and often smaller sort of hospital based studies that have come out um, on this question, many of them have found very muted or even null effects for uh, severe outcomes for uh, for COVID-19 for persons with HIV. And that's often because they're actually already studying hospitalized populations. That once mm -hmm. you're in the hospital, it seems that the outcomes, uh, you know, you're already so far down the pathway, as it were, that the outcomes seem sort of comparable um, or not very uh, largely different between persons with HIV and not. But what this seems to suggest is it's actually that likelihood of needing to go to the hospital in the first place, having severe enough COVID-19 to get you to that point that seems to drive these outcomes. And then I'm curious, um, you know, based on, on what you know from this paper and other work you've done in general knowledge, um, do you think this is something that seems like it's a difference from who has HIV and the risk of getting sick, et cetera, or the virus itself and, and the disease, uh, you know, immune compromised state, et cetera? Right. It's hard to pick out all of, all of the pieces. We attempted to get at sort of the, the role of CD4, for example, mm -hmm. um, in this. I mean, as you know, we looked at sort of HIV uh, disease stage, which is CD, you know, defined by different uh, cut points of CD4 uh, cell, cell counts. And there definitely does seem to be a gradient that we observed. Um, it's not in this figure, but we saw a gradient from stage one to two to three of sort of increased uh, uh, hospitalization and mortality according to that gradient. And then, you know, a natural next question, well, what about stage one, right? People who are effectively at the, you know, the highest level, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're well managed, they're, they're high, high CD4 counts. What's their level of increased risk? And we actually compared them to the population without HIV. And even still, persons in stage one had, ele had sort of uh, elevated hospitalization rates, just not as severe as the other groups. So that doesn't, you know, that doesn't fully answer all the questions. You can say, well, what about other comorbidities, right? There's all the whole whole slew of questions to still answer. But seeing that gradient um, is suggestive that there maybe is a role for CD4 count at least. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so that brings us to about the end of our time. The last thing I want to say is because I think sometimes with when we're looking at all these stats and parsing data and looking at rates, it can really easy to kind of lose uh, some of the humanity behind the numbers. I don't have a great answer for that. But what really struck me was 
this death that there were was about a hundred thousand New Yorkers with HIV. You're looking at HIV. About three thousand got COVID during that three month period. You're looking at here, um, and nearly nine hundred were hospitalized. And of those, two hundred seven died. Um, and you know, each of those are are individual people. But it's 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 so I think hard for us to wrap right. our head around what these numbers mean. And and that was something that really struck me. What those what how those numbers filter down. That's right. I, I fully agree. And that's where I, I, I started with that 2.55. And, and, and we, we, we published another figure that sort of is the merger of that with what you just said, which is that we lost a little over one in 500 persons with HIV in, in, in New York to this, to this. And in, in just a few months, right, this is from March mm-hmm. to mid to, to really just three months, really March to June, we lost one in 500 New Yorkers uh, living with an HIV diagnosis to COVID-19. And that's just a human tragedy that is just hard to wrap around. And it's statewide, not just the city, which was hit much harder than the rest That's of the right. state. That's right, all so. of New York State. Right. You know, and so here we are in New York, which um, has such a high uh, burden of HIV infection, the second highest in the st- in the country, also hit so early with COVID-19. It's really unfor- it was an unfortunate perfect storm you know, with a huge human toll. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. This is really great work um, and, and just been fascinating for me to look at. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Great. Of course, uh, if, you're, if you're following along, you can get this paper and more at GeminiWorkOpen.com, where everything is, of course, free and open access. Uh, we've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And, of course, join us next week, February 16th at 3 p.m. Central, for the next episode of Jano Live. So stay safe and take care.